We're going to talk about cerebral palsy. This is a fairly lengthy talk. And we're only going to talk some, about some general aspects of managing children with cerebral palsy. And in some ways, it's managing the families, too. Um, and we're primarily going to talk about the orthopedic interventions for kids who are, in some ways, less involved, the ambulatory kids. So these are some of the basic concepts that were, uh, I'd like to say, beaten into me um, by one of my uh, teachers as a resident, Andy Coleman, who was probably one of the most thoughtful people taking care of cerebral palsy that I've ever worked with. Um, one of the things that you have to do as a, as a surgeon or a physician of any kind taking care of kids with CP is you have to determine who needs an operation. You need to decide um, there's some basic general physician, family, and patient requirements that you have to have, and we'll talk about those. We're going to talk about the surgeon's responsibilities, and then there are some family responsibilities that you have to get out on the table early on. So who needs surgery for cerebral palsy? These are basically kids who have failed a maximum uh, trial of all the non-operative treatments uh, for their symptomatology. This includes PT, OT, oral medications. Usually this is all spasticity management, neuromuscular blockade. This is Botox, Dysport, whichever you use. Um, some of the things like baclofen, some of the uh, uh, ways you can give it orally or with a pump. These are the kids that fail all those things, and then the orthopedic surgeon needs to deal with, with those outcomes. These are deformities that interfere with the patient's function, their ambulation, their ability to stand or do transfers. There are also deformities that interfere with uh, their positioning, their hygiene, and these are primarily the non-ambulatory kids. You've got to be realistic in taking care of the kids, and you really need to be very upfront with the families. What you're going to do is not going to take a non-ambulatory patient necessarily and make them walk. And everybody needs to know these things up front. It's expectation management. The family and the patient have to be reliable. You can't go and do a series of extensive operations on kids with cerebral palsy if you've got a family that isn't going to take the kid to physical therapy afterwards, isn't going to come for routine appointments. It's not just an operation, it's a series of procedures and it's a long relationship that you're going to have with these kids and their families and everybody has to be equally uh, part of it. They've got to have some type of uh, support structure in place to make their appointments, to make their physical therapy uh, uh, times. When I practiced in uh, the inner city of Detroit, we stopped doing a lot of big CP surgery because my patient population didn't have access to physical therapy. They didn't have transportation. They were better off not having an operation than having a big operation, causing them pain, causing the family uh, problems, and then not gaining any benefit from it. You have to have the other side of that, they have to have availability for PT and OT, and all of these things have to be in place before you put kids through a big procedure. It's your responsibility as a surgeon to educate the family and the patient, if the patient is understanding, as much as possible about what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, and what's going to happen afterwards. If you just tell them that you're going to do a big operation on their child's foot and everything's going to be fine, then you're not telling them what they need to know. They need to know up front that it's going to be uncomfortable. Their child's going to have post-operative issues and immobilization and things that they just have to know. It's Again, it's expectation uh, management. You've got to be selective. Every kid who comes in your office who has a foot deformity does not need an operation. And you have to think a little bit. And surgeons sometimes aren't so good about thinking. Um, your goal of doing surgery is to try and do as much surgery at, at one time as you possibly can try and maximize all their rehabilitation efforts into one event. Um, we talk about doing multi-level surgery on ambulatory kids with cerebral palsy, and there's a reason for that. You want to try and get all their rehab done at once so that you can move them along and advance their, 
activities all at one time. And don't get in over your head. Um, if you don't, you're not familiar with doing uh, surgery for kids with cerebral palsy, you probably shouldn't be doing it on your own. Ask for help. There's probably someone in your group or your practice who's better, uh, has, has a little more experience. It's not the time to practice. Surgery, you know, we talk about the practice of medicine. Uh, you really shouldn't be practicing surgery on people too often. From the family standpoint, they have to listen. Um, they have to understand. And if you have to spend a lot of time with them to get that to happen, that's what you have to do. They have to realize that all surgery, even the smallest appearing tendon lengthening, is a big deal. Um, bad things happen any time the child goes to sleep, and that's a possibility, and they need to be aware of that. They have to realize that they have specific responsibilities afterwards. It's not just a magic bullet. They have to be aware that the surgery is just one part of the intervention for their child, and the therapy after the surgery is probably as important, if not more important, than what you just did for them surgically, and that it's going to take some level of time to get back to baseline before they ever had surgery as far as function is concerned. And like this child who's got a terrible looking x-ray and if all you do is treat their dislocated hip and you don't realize that they've got family issues, they've got, they don't have problems with positioning, they don't have problems with hygiene, you don't just treat the x-ray. Sometimes it's better to just do nothing. At least do nothing surgically. So timing of surgery is very important. Um, some of the folks, you were there in the clinic today. Um, you know, we talked with families that we try and uh, put off surgery as long as possible in kids with cerebral palsy for a number of reasons. And one of the primary reasons is that the recurrence rate, anything that you do can the deformity can recur. So your recurrence rate goes down significantly if you can do it on a child over age about seven. Six to eight is sort of the rule of thumb. Um, this is particularly a, an issue uh, with distal surgery, foot, ankle, hamstrings, things of that nature. The recurrence rate is just much higher. So you want to put it off as long as possible. And that's why you maximize your physical therapy, your occupational therapy, your spasticity management your bracing, your serial casting, if that's what you need to do, to try and get that child as old as possible before putting them through an operation. These are the things to remember in kids who are ambulatory, and that's primarily who we're talking about right now. You manage the deformities that are limiting their function. It's not operations just because things don't look very good. You have to look at the entire patient. You don't just focus on one joint. If their heel cord's tight and they come in complaining that the kid's up on their toes, well, you need to examine the whole patient because the reason they may be up on their toes may be their hamstrings are tight, and it's not necessarily just their heel cords. So you may have to deal with that. Um, all the lower extremities are completely interconnected. One of the things that uh, is important to try and avoid is sort of operating on kids around their birthday. And Mercer Rang, who was a uh, orth pediatric orthopedic surgeon at the University of Toronto for years, coined a term, the birthday uh, surgery. And this was basically something that looked like this, where around their second birthday, they got their heel cords lengthened because they were up on their toes. Over the next year, everybody realized, oh, their hamstrings are tight. So for their third birthday, they get their hamstrings done. And then that makes their hip contracture obvious. So for their next birthday, they get another operation. And this is why you try and take care of the whole child and do everything at once. So you're not putting them in the hospital four times over four years and doing things in a stepwise fashion. You want to take care of the whole uh, child. This is, Mer this is a picture of the cover of Mercer Rang's book uh, that somehow Dennis Wenger got his name on. Um, but uh, Mercer did all of the uh, drawings in the book he was an incredibly interesting man to listen to. I looked this up on, e on Amazon the other day, and a copy of it new on Amazon is going for $700 right now. It's out of, been out of print for about 15 years, but it's a beautifully written book. 
these are the things that you have to take into account when you're doing uh, decision making about this with CP, particularly the ambulatory patients. You need to do a good history. It seems silly. Orthopedic surgeons aren't very good about taking histories, but it is important. You need to know if they met their motor milestones. You need to know how long, old they were when they walked. You need to know what surgeries they've had. You just need to know what's going on with the patient. Like we talked about, you have to do a careful physical exam. Admittedly, we're not so good about listening to the heart and the lungs. We sort of figure out if they've gotten there, they're probably heart and lung wise okay. But uh, their extremity exam is very, very important. Imaging is sometimes of value in the lower extremities. We'll talk a little bit about gait analysis in a little bit. Formal gait analysis with a gait lab is, some people believe in it very, very strongly. I have never had the luxury until the last nine months of having a gait lab in anywhere that I've worked, so I don't have a great experience with it. But it is of value, and some people believe in it very strongly. I like an examination under anesthesia for kids uh, prior to, even if I've made a decision about their surgery, I always make a point before prepping and draping of examining their lower extremities under anesthesia because that gives you the, uh, a really good view of the kids without the spasticity under t overtones and you get a true uh, exam of the amount of contractures that they may have and those are the ones that need to be taken care of surgically. You need to know as far as history, did they have pro did parents have problems during the pregnancy? Was the child preterm? Um, we saw two little girls today at the end of clinic who were 27 weekers, and they are fantastic. Uh, you know, the kids are very, very bright. You can tell that they are there intellectually, but because of their prematurity, they have significant issues. I always ask if they, the child went home with mom because at least in the states that's a red flag. If the child doesn't go home with mom, there's usually something else going on. Ask them about their developmental milestones. Um, I always want to know when the child sat up by themselves. I like to know when they at least stood by themselves. Um, I'm not so concerned about walking because some kids just don't walk until they're ready. And certainly there are kids who don't crawl at all. They, the first thing they'll do is get up and walk. Want to know if they have any associated medical problems? Do, have they had any previous surgery? And are there any other red flags as far as their medical history? Their exams, very important. Uh, you want to check their active and passive range of motion. I like to do what I've always termed an observational gait analysis. Again, I've never had luxury of a formal gait lab, but uh, I've done pretty well with a nice long hallway. You watch the kids from the front and the back. If they need to have their mom walk down the hallway with them so they have confidence, you let them do it. But it's very, very important to give them a good wide space to walk in. I like to look at them pretty systematically. I'll watch their hands, believe it or not, while they walk because that's very important in kids who are potentially hemiplegic. You want to see if they posture one or both of their hands. I like to look at them from the front and from the side as much as possible. And I like to do a pretty decent neuro, neuro exam, looking for tone abnormalities, looking for clonus, looking for spasticity, uh, and trying to find out how their strength is and whether it's balanced from side to side. Imaging, I think, is uh, probably overused. Uh, I go to Guatemala a couple times a year, and every kid with cerebral palsy shows up with whatever extremity involved with an x-ray because uh, private radiologists are very willing to take the money from people down there. Um, but imaging isn't that terribly important. The deformity of the foot, you can tell without an x-ray what's going on. As far as the hips are concerned, an x-ray is incredibly important. And the more involved the child is, the more routinely you need to examine their hips both clinically and radiographically. Um, there's a very strong need to do a type of hip surveillance where you see a uh, child and see their x-rays of their hips every year on a routine basis, particularly the older the child, or the more involved the child is. Um, one of the things that you cannot tell on uh, plain x-ray is their rotational profile. That's purely an examination, physical exam finding. Some people will do CT uh, 
antiversion or rotational studies, but I've never found them terribly useful in uh, special needs kids. Gait analysis is still pretty controversial. It depends whether you have a gait lab or not. Um, if you have a gait lab, it's essential for decision making. If you don't have a gait lab, there's absolutely no need for it. Um, not everyone has access. The Shriner system fortunately has very, very good gait labs at the majority of their uh, facilities and uh, very, very bright people who are able to generate excellent studies so that you can not only review the child in a systematic fashion with video, with EMG studies on a pre and post operative basis, but you can also sit down with some other really <laughs> smart people to help you make decision make to do decision making on what's important and what's potentially going to benefit that child. I'm trying to learn how to do that at this point. EMG is useful if you have access to a, a formal gait study lab um, to look at uh, uh, motor function with gait. If you sort of break down where gait labs are really important, they're probably more reliable uh, uh, proximally. Uh, observational type gait analysis and physical exam to me is probably more useful as far as the foot and ankle is concerned, but looking at rotation, particularly in the upper, or the upper part of the limb, and looking at the motion of the pelvis, the hamstrings, uh, the knees, is very, very well done with gait studies. It tends to overestimate range of motion, uh, sometimes particularly for the foot and the ankle. Um, so you really have to depend a little bit on your physical exam. As far as gait is concerned, these for the students, you just need to know what's normal as far as normal gait. You need to look at the stability of the limb when the kids are in stance, so that's when the uh, extremity is on the ground fully. You need to look at the clearance of the limb when this and swing phase. You need to look at the shifting of the uh, limb from during stance to swing and you need to look at the occurrence of these various components to look at the max and try and maximize the efficiency of gait uh, for the patient. These are just some types of pathologic gait uh, that you can see various patterns and if you look uh, uh, and read a little bit about gait analysis, these will all be mentioned to some degree. These are some of the causes of deviations of gait um, they can deviate secondary to just the underlying neurologic disorder that the patient may have. Spasticity is a major player in uh, causing uh, pathologic gait. Patient's balance and coordination, these are things that we can't manage orthopedically. We can make their extremities work better, but we cannot control their balance or coordination. We can just give them the best possible set of uh, extremities to work with. Some of the uh, changes in gait are secondary to uh, various uh, functions. Uh, growth is a problem. As the ch child gets taller, the child gets heavier, it can cause problems with gait. Uh, as kids get older, they will progress from what's considered a dynamic contracture. And a dynamic contracture, by definition, is if you use the ankle, for example, uh, a dynamic contracture is a joint that may look like it's in, in equinus for the foot and ankle. However, with maximum passive range of motion, with passive stretch, you can put it in a uh, plantar grade or uh, flat to the ground position. At some point during growth, that dynamic contracture will often become static or fixed, and those are the extremity uh, problems that need to be taken care of surgically. These are just, this is an article that pointed out some of the problems with gait analysis. Uh, Ken Noonan, who uh, uh, is up in Milwaukee and uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, sent out uh, gait studies from 11 different patients from four centers and uh, had them reviewed and had significant variability uh, even within the center redoing the same gait study. And only two of these 11 patients had even similar treatment options recommended. 
by the uh, uh, people performing the gate study. So there's a significant amount of variability uh, within centers and between. I like examination under anesthesia. I think it's a very important part of uh, taking care of these kids, particularly before committing them to a, uh, an open operation. It does take away the spasticity once they get to sleep. You can get a true uh, estimate of their range of motion, and that will determine whether they have a dynamic. So if before uh, they go to sleep they have a terrible contracture, but it seems to go away when they're asleep, that's basically a dynamic contracture. That should be man manageable with some type of either neuromuscular blockade, physical therapy, stretching, casting program. Um, so I find this a very uh, good uh, way to confirm my original diagnosis, my original plan, and I've certainly changed my operative plan based on the exam under anesthesia. So we're just going to go through a, uh, some standard orthopedic interventions, some standard procedures in the lower extremities for kids with CP. The only one we're not going to really talk about is tibial de-irritation and osteotomy. So the iliopsoas is the primary hip flexor. Um, these kids will uh, show up and have symptoms of increased hip flexion, uh, which limits their ability to be upright. Again, these are not problems that are by themselves. These, most of these kids have multiple joints that are involved, and you'll see that they oftentimes all need to be managed uh, at the same time. You examine the hip, as you see up here on the uh, top right. This is the Thomas test. Uh, you flex up both hips, hold one up against the chest, and bring the other uh, leg down, and you'll feel the resistance begin. And the, the leg that's flexed up holds the pelvis in place so it can't rock forward. And any hip flexion contracture greater than about 30 degrees is going to interfere with gait. And if you're considering taking care of these ambulatory kids surgically, that's probably something that needs to be addressed. Um, you can try having the patient walk in a kneeling position. If you can imagine some more involved kids, that's certainly not uh, doable. But that takes the hamstrings, which can also affect the pelvis, out of the picture. I'm not sure I can walk on my knees anymore. Um, if they have a significant iliopsoas contracture, their gait analysis will show that their pelvis is tilted anteriorly. They get this type of uh, double bump, uh, as described, uh, while the form uh, in their wave pattern as they walk, and their pelvis will not extend as well uh, when they do uh, gait studies. Management for me, often when I schedule these kids for surgery, it's always a possible iliopsoas release because I want to examine them under anesthesia. And as soon as the anesthesiologist has the tube taped, I will go and examine them. I'll do a Thompson Thomas test on the table and make sure that their hip contracture is uh, fixed. Um, it can be done, it's traditionally done at the brim of the pelvis, which requires you to find the femoral uh, nerve aster bundle. Uh, you can somewhat cheat getting to it that way by not finding it, but finding it on end is not a good idea. So it's best to have it retracted and out of the way. There are uh, uh, some anecdotal papers, very small studies that show that releasing it off the ileus, off the uh, uh, lesser trochanter just through a groin incision works just as well and is just as efficacious. Derotational osteotomies, the femur, are common problems, or common uh, interventions in kids with cerebral palsy. These are kids who have a significant amount of internal rotation, and it's uh, basically a retained femoral antiversion issue. Their proximal femurs, if you examine them prone, uh, you will see they have significant internal rotation, and it's generally best to examine all these kids prone if you can, similar to what you see on the top there. Um, oftentimes if they have their good walkers and they have significant uh, internal rotation from their femurs, they'll have a almost compensatory external rotation of the tibia to try and keep their foot over time underneath them. Um, 
gait analysis in these kids will show increased internal rotation throughout their gait cycle. It's not something that shows up just during one phase. It'll be consistent throughout the gait cycle. You can use uh, computerized tomography antiversion studies if you wish, but it's really very easily done uh, with a physical exam. Um, you can do an examination under anesthesia with uh, fluoroscopy in the operating room to look at the femoral neck. Um, but again, you probably should be able to do this just from a clinical examination. Management is generally surgical uh, in most cases, obviously. Um, you can derotate the femur either proximally or distally. Traditionally in orthopedics, we were all taught to do it uh, proximally through the intertrochanteric region. Um, folks in Los Angeles have shown that there's really no difference doing it any, in any part of the femur. I have moved away from doing it in the uh, intertrochanteric region just because it's easier to do it a little more distally. This is the traditional way that you do it with a blade plate. A uh, blade plate is a, a device that uh, is uh, no longer taught because the company is uh, trying to get out of the business of making them, but basically you osteotomize the femur right there, rotate it, the, the shaft externally, and then fix the two pieces back together. Um, the nice thing about a blade plate is it's very, very stable and you can weight bear the kids very early. Hamstring lengthening uh, is a very common operation for kids with uh, cerebral palsy who are ambulatory. Um, these are kids who will have uh, evidence of increasing knee flexion. Uh, when they walk, they will crouch. They'll have anterior knee pain because their patellas are being stressed against their, prox or, uh, against their distal femur. Um, measuring out their popliteal angle here, once the popliteal angle, as you see, it's greater than 60 degrees. It's very problematic for walking. Um, and these generally need to be uh, in, uh, managed surgically. You'll often see the patella, which is what's called patella alte, where the patella is relatively proximal or high riding, secondary to uh, uh, long-standing pull of the quads and the hamstrings at the same time. The EMGs in these kids will demonstrate uh, hamstring activity throughout the uh, gait cycle. And again, for me, an examination under anesthesia is very important and helpful to look at uh, the dynamic versus fixed contracture. <coughs> Medial hamstring lengthening uh, surgically is done in about 10 different ways. Um, in all of them, in some way, shape, or form, you lengthen all three of the medial hamstrings the uh, gracilis, the semitendinosus, and the semimembranosus. Um, for those of you who have forgotten your anatomy, the semimembranosus is a big flat muscle down in this area and doesn't have a good tendon to lengthen, so you basically uh, cut the tendinous portion but leave the muscle intact. The others you can uh, either completely uh, release or do some type of a Z lengthening. It's really a more a matter of training. Um, for the most part, the lateral hamstring or the biceps femoris rarely needs to be lengthened. Um, I have seen one patient who had their biceps femoris lengthened, or at least the uh, surgeon thought they lengthened it, and in fact they lengthened the peroneal nerve, uh, which doesn't do well. Um, the, uh, sometimes if the deformity is very, very severe, you'll have to release their posterior capsule but I probably haven't done that in about 15 to 20 years, and it's rarely necessary at this point. Uh, what you don't want to do is ever have to do a secondary or a re-lengthening of the hamstrings, because once you do this, it becomes a, a large wad of scar, and the next operation is basically a scar lengthening rather than uh, definable tendons. The rectus femoris, as everybody remembers, is anteriorly, is the central muscle attaching the patella. Um, these kids, when they have rectus uh, tightness, they'll have a very stiff knee gait. Interestingly, it's often tight at the same time as the hamstrings being tight, and they won't be able to clear the floor well when they walk. <clears throat> 
This is the Duncan Ely test. This is an important one to uh, perform. Again, the patient is prone, and you slowly flex up the lower extremity at the knee, and when the rectus is tight, their butt, which is under this guy's hand, will start to lift up. And it's kind of, it can be very subtle, but it's uh, something that's important to feel, and it's an important physical finding. Imaging studies for uh, trying to determine rectus femoris tightness is just not of any value. These kids have very diminished, oftentimes, uh, knee range of motion in all the planes. Um, particularly swing, they'll have a stiff knee gait. Even if they're flexed and they're walking with a crouch gait, they still don't have much flexion or extension, and that's because of their uh, rectus femoris. If you look at their EMGs uh, during these gait studies, you'll see that the rectus and the hamstrings are firing at the same time. If you think about it, that's not supposed to happen. That's a function of their original brain injury, and that's what you see happen. Um, for me, the examination under anesthesia doesn't help me very much with determining this. Oftentimes, the transfers uh, for the rectus are done at the same time as a hamstring lengthening. It was originally described as taking off the central uh, portion of the rectus and then transferring it up to the sartorius. Um, people have then moved to transferring it to the gracilis or the semitendinosus. There's a couple of papers in the last uh, five years or so which have shown no real difference between transferring the tendon and just simply releasing it. Transferring it has, uh, at least in my practice, gone away. I think uh, releasing it works just fine. And the foot and the ankle, this is the primary thing that you're going to see. This is the this is the first entrance of most of these kids into the orthopedic office, is to manage their foot and ankle deformity. So Aquinas is a straight drop foot. Aquinovarus is a drop foot that's inverted or turned inward. Um, this is the most common pattern that you see in kids who are hemiplegic or a single side involvement. Plano valgus, which is a uh, flat foot and usually rotated externally. This is more common in the kids who are diplegic uh, cerebral palsy patients. Radiographs sometimes are helpful um, in these kids. Um, Dr. DeBarg may disagree with me. I'm not a big x-ray person uh, for a lot of foot deformities, but if you're going to get foot and ankle films, you always try and obtain them weight-bearing. It is of no value in a weight-bearing walking child to get non-weight-bearing films. Again, examination under anesthesia is very, very useful. Uh, part of it uh, will help you to determine the contribution of the gastroc or, and the soleus, or both, to any Aquinas contracture. You need to examine them with their knee extended to look at their gastroc, because their gastroc muscle crosses the knee joint. And then you need to look at them with the knee flexed to uh, isolate the uh, soleus muscle. Um, if you're going to examine the hind foot, and this is one of the things that you see often from physical therapists, they will send a patient in for a heel co cord, or they will send a patient in with uh, uh, paperwork saying that they don't have a heel cord contracture, and that's because they didn't examine the patient's heel cord correctly. You have to invert the hind foot um, because that locks the subtalar joint and allows you to actually test the tightness of the uh, gastroc soleus complex. Kids with equinus contractures can have all sorts of problems with their gait. They may be up on their toes, they may be looking in a jump positioning, they may be tripping because they can't clear their foot when they swing through. They'll always have diminished range of motion passively uh, when you try and dorsiflex them. You may see some sustained spasm or almost clonus when, they, when you try and do a uh, rapid stretch. And it's important, again, to test the foot in a varus position to make sure that uh, you get a true look at the uh, heel cord tightness. They'll always have some type of plantar flexion of the hind foot. Um, they have, tend to have normal alignment of the midfoot and hind foot. This is true Aquinas. And uh, their medial and lateral columns are the inner and outer part of their foot.
are normal appearing in length. They don't have a big hook uh, to the uh, forefoot. In gait analysis for these kids, they'll have a uh, sign of excessive plantar flexion throughout stance and phase. If you think about when you walk, your foot's not pointing toward the ground when you're swinging it through. These kids, it stays down the whole time. Um, they have abnormal uh, generation of power in mid stance, and their gastroc will often be firing throughout uh, all phases of gait. Surgical management, it seems very easy. You just go in there and lengthen the heel cord, but there's a little more to it than that. There's multiple ways of managing this. You can either recess the tendon, which you see on the bottom down here, where you just do uh, lengthening of the aponeurosis or the tendinous portion above the muscle, or you can lengthen the entire tendon, which you see above, which is termed a Z-lengthening. There are, is some controversy as far as what's best. Um, when you start arguing about this, this is a group of people who don't have much else to argue about, but um, there's some thought that you have diminished push-off strength if you do a Z-lengthening. The problem with recurrence, your push-off strength is retained, but you have an increased risk of uh, recurrence of your deformity. Um, there's also a concern with Z-lengthening that you may over-lengthen the uh, uh, heel cord, which can be problematic later on as it continues to stretch out. This is a child, this is a picture of a, sort of a classic kid with an equina varus deformity. You can see that not only is the uh, foot uh, pointing down a little bit, but it's also turned up, or what's termed supinated, the, and the, uh, and the front portion of the foot toward the toes is rotated inward. Um, these uh, kids, if you consider their mid portion of their foot and the outer portion of the foot, Functionally, their lateral side or outer side uh, just looks a little bit longer than the medial side. Again, you have to decide which part of this is dynamic and which part of it's fixed. Um, you have to decide if the posterior tibial tendon is uh, a player in this and it's something that you need to deal with and how much you have to deal with the uh, gastroxoleus complex. And in these kids, you have to decide if there's some of it that's a fixed bony deformity and uh, there's something termed a Coleman block test where you stand the child partially on a small block and look at the position of their hind foot. And that can determine whether you have to do something uh, bony to their calcaneus. These are the most common procedures that you would see in a kid with an equina varus deformity, a heel cord lengthening or recession. Some of this is basically your training as much as anything. Um, SPOTT stands for a split posterior tibial tendon transfer. And that is what you see up at the top there. You take part of the posterior tibial tendon and actually take it behind the tibia and sew it into one of the perineal tendons. And that basically allows you to balance the foot and balance the pull of the muscles between the medial and lateral sides. And in some kids, you have to do something to the calcaneus. And that's what you see down below. And that's uh, basically uh, closing wedge type osteotomy of the calcaneus. And that is uh, something that was described by Dr. Dwyer back in the uh, 60s uh, to take the hind foot out of varus or out of internal rotation. Split tibial, uh, posterior tibial tendon transfer was something described back in 1977. Uh, these are generally almost universally for hemiplegic patients. Um, I saw a patient today who had bilateral attempts at this and uh, it was uh, definite problem with patient selection. Um, the, the kids that do best with this are a little bit older, ages 4 to 14. You tend to transfer just half of the tendon, usually the plantar or, or lower half of the tendon, and you transfer it behind the tibia and the fibula into the perineus brevis. Again, it works best in kids who have constant firing of the posterior tibial tendon because it allows you to balance the foot uh, after surgery. You can do this either through four small incisions or two large incisions. How long you mobilize this uh, and put them in a cast is purely dependent uh, uh, on your practice. I usually keep them non-weight bearing for about four weeks and then a, a walking cast for a couple of weeks after that. This is not an operation to get kids out of braces. 
just as you should really never tell any parent of a child with CP that you're operating on them so they can be brace free. This is one where oftentimes the families will think that everything's going to be fine, you're going to make them a normal foot, it's still going to need a brace. And a Dwyer is uh, uh, an osteotomy for varus. In these kids, the hind foot is tilted inward and it, in typical orthopedic fashion, this is basically carpentry. You take a piece out of it, close the area that you made, you can fix it with a staple, you can fix it with smooth pins, you can fix it with a screw. It's uh, dealer's choice, but the bone, the beauty of the calcaneus is it heals very, very quickly, and the kids can walk on this uh, in about four weeks. Plane of valgus foot or a flat foot. Uh, oftentimes is managed surgically. Sometimes you have to do an osteotomy the calcaneus for these kids if they have a fixed deformity. And in some ways it's the opposite of a Dwyer. Um, that you can do an operation where you fuse the subtalar joint, which is the joint between the tip, uh, talus and the calcaneus. You can do a type of osteotomy where you lengthen the uh, calcaneus. And most of the time they require uh, heel cord lengthening in combination with whatever you do. This is your a bad plane of valgus foot. You can see that this child's basically standing on the head of his uh, talus and his navicular. The entire foot seems to be swung out laterally. Um, the heel cord in these kids, although it doesn't appear to be something that would have a tight heel cord, if you examine them correctly, they almost all have a tight heel cord. The mid portion of the foot is pronated and the entire forefoot is supinated or turned inward and the lateral column or the lateral side of the foot is functionally shorter than the inside or the medial portion of the foot. This is a good Greek name. Uh, he described uh, the uh, medial dis displacement osteotomy back in uh, 1971 just for run-of-the-mill flat feet. Dr. Coleman, who was my boss, uh, and I wrote this up in 1993 for uh, cerebral palsy patients. It works extremely well for a child as an isolated procedure if the only problem they have in their foot is the uh, back part of the foot's valgus or tipped laterally. It doesn't affect the middle portion of the foot or the forefoot at all, and uh, it does functionally lengthen the heel cord a little bit. This is what you do to do this operation. You make a lateral incision uh, parallel to your perineal tendons. Uh, osteotomize the cal uh, calcaneus and actually slide the entire posterior portion medially. You can fix this with pins. The key is not to tilt it into varus or tilt it inward because we just spent three slides telling you that you shouldn't, that you need to fix a varus hind foot. You certainly don't want to create one surgically. This operation uh, is really for historical purposes only. Uh, you may come across the Grice procedure. Uh, it's certainly not done very much in the States anymore. Uh, it's a procedure where you do a bone block fusion of the subtalar joint. It was originally described for polio. Uh, it's been written up with very results for cerebral palsy. There's some people who still believe in it uh, quite religiously. Uh, the problem is it's got a very high complication rate uh, in CP kids. The graphs slip. There's a high incidence of non-union. Uh, there's a lot of late deformity uh, issues. It's probably an operation whose time has uh, come and gone. If you're going to do a Grice procedure, if you absolutely have nothing else that you want to do for this kid, uh, you certainly have to stabilize it either with a screw or some type of uh, implant to allow it to stay in position and to heal. Finally, this is a lateral column lengthening. This is uh, an operation that's done very, very frequently for kids with uh, neuromuscular flat foot. It's credited to Dr. Evans back in their 70s, but Vince Mosca, who's at the University of Washington, really popularized this operation in the uh, middle 90s. Uh, it's an operation for flat feet and uh, both for uh, kids without neurologic issues as well as with. Um, it was originally thought to be contraindicated in, in neuromuscular kids but it's certain, I think it probably gets more uh, use in uh, kids who have neuromuscular problems now than those without. Basically, it looks very, very simple. You 
make a cut in the uh, lateral uh, calcaneus about a centimeter and a half proximal to the calcaneal cuboid joint and open it up. And that seems like a pretty straightforward thing. But the mechanics of the foot, particularly with the intact plantar fascia, um, allows this small procedure in the hind foot to affect the midfoot and the forefoot, and it's an incredibly uh, powerful operation. This is just an intraoperative uh, procedure or picture. Uh, this can be done through a pretty small incision. That's the osteotomy. That's a little piece of allograft that's used to hold it open. You can use autograft from the patient themselves, but uh, that requires you to uh, uh, have the morbidity of taking a piece of iliac crest, at least in the States, finding uh, iliac crest allograft is extremely easy in most hospitals. Um, so this is what it looks like. The problem is uh, that sometimes this graft subsides over time and the deformity will uh, recur. So in conclusion, this is uh, just some basic points on ambulatory patients. Um, our goal is to as a treating physician, you need to maximize all your data, have all your information before you get to the operating room. I tell the residents on a regular basis, the operating room is not the place to be thinking. The operating room is generally a place to be doing the things that you thought about beforehand. You want to maximize your non-operative intervention prior to surgery. You want to do everything you can to minimize your potential for recurrence, but remember that every kid's a little different and uh, when you think you've done the best operation in the world, it can still fall flat on your face. Um, you need to try and correct as many deformities as possible. Multi-level surgery is really the way to go on these ambulatory patients uh, and uh, try and rehab them all at once. Maximize your rehab opportunities. Try and get them done.